Welcome, welcome, welcome to this Q2 2020 edition of the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops Masterclass. If you'd like to take a look at the list of all the upcoming events, go to citrix.com slash events. Today, my colleague Rob Beekmans and I, Mayank Singh, will be delivering the session in tandem. Both of us are technical marketing architects and have been with Citrix for a fair few years, working on Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops in technical content creation and competitive intelligence roles. If you have questions, please type them in the chat window and we'll try to answer them at the end of the webinar. As you will see in the agenda slide, we have a lot of things to talk about in terms of the value add to Windows Virtual Desktop Platform that Citrix brings to enable business continuity. We begin by discussing the role remote PC plays here. Windows Virtual Desktops focuses on app virtualization and VDI only. Citrix can embed it into a variety of other digital workspace services to enable admins to build their next generation workspace. In terms of image management, MCS, MCSIO and app layering help to build and manage large fleets of virtual desktops. Windows Virtual Desktop includes some basic tooling for this, but we provide a battle-tested management framework that makes management easy, reduces risk by enabling fast rollbacks and wipe on log off to prevent image pollution and increases performance. With respect to user profiles, they can be a large source of the user experience and application issues. FS Logix already solves a fair number of these. We can build on top of FS Logix to make user profiles even more solid, especially for advanced scenarios while increasing their flexibility at the same time with Profile Manager. Teams and Browser Content Redirection The performance of the applications running on the desktop has a direct impact on the user experience and productivity. Citrix provides optimizations for Teams and web-based applications, which makes them perform like they were installed locally on the user's endpoint, but while keeping all the benefits of app and desktop virtualization. SD-WAN. Admins need to make sure users have a good network connection to their Windows Virtual Desktop workloads and from there to the application backends such as databases and file shares. With SD-WAN and the network location service, this becomes a lot easier while providing detailed insights into the network traffic. Finally, Analytics. A modern digital workspace consists of many moving parts ranging from Windows Virtual Desktop to web and SaaS apps to file shares. Spotting security related anomalies or performance bottlenecks with traditional approaches is challenging. That's why Citrix provides Citrix Analytics Service, which helps Windows Virtual Desktop admins to find these anomalies before they can become issues. With all that to cover, we begin with business continuity. I was struck by this picture that Rob had chosen for the slide, as I can't say I have been that comfortable working from home in this Indian summer. And I'm also in a different city with the only network access being my 4G phone or a dongle. Most IT teams have also not been this relaxed when trying to get their employees productive while working from home. This pandemic has caught quite a few of those teams flat-footed having to pressure purchase equipment or provide corporate network access to a variety of personal devices just to enable users to work. Here in India, the government has had to relax bonded warehouse regulations and IT folks have had to ferry desktops and monitors or laptops to employees wherever they were to keep them productive. How can we be better prepared and how has Citrix helped with making the experience as close to painless as possible for existing customers or even new customers? Let's take a look. The business continuity options available to customers are threefold. Both existing and new customers can have their users securely connect to their physical desktops from wherever they are using remote PC access. Existing customers can choose to expand their Citrix deployments to bring up VDI workloads in the cloud. 
New customers can use Citrix cloud services that run Windows virtual desktop workloads such as Citrix managed desktops to rapidly provision VMs in Azure or use Citrix virtual apps and desktop service to deploy desktops in any cloud. Let's quickly take a look at these options. The first is remote PC access. In the traditional sense, remote PC access takes the physical machines that were used as clients to access VDI resources and converts them into hosts for sessions themselves. They become part of the on-premises resource location. The advantages of remote PC access are as follows. It provides single sign-on enabled secure remote access to company resources. The user experience is delivered via the best HDX technologies without needing a VPN. This is done via Citrix Gateway. We support an HTML5 clientless agent. Admins can gain insights into user behavior and detect anomalies via Citrix Analytics. Wake on LAN capabilities in case the desktop is powered off accidentally are provided using Microsoft SCCM. Security is enhanced by having watermarking, session recording, and app protection policies like anti-key logging and anti-screen capture enabled on the session. Citrix has rolled out remote PC entitlements for these service offerings. Let's take a look at some of these offerings and see how you can use them not just for remote PC, but much, much more. The first conceptual diagram is a standard on-premises Citrix virtual apps and desktops deployment that users use to access on-premises virtualized Windows apps and desktops with. Most of you would be familiar with this deployment. It includes the Citrix desktop delivery controller, a storefront server, Citrix gateway, and a few other components like firewalls, etc. If we want to add physical desktops as resources to this kind of a setup, we can use remote PC access. The admin will install a Citrix virtual delivery agent on the physical machines, then create a catalog and a delivery group and assign users to their desktops. Once this is done, users can begin accessing these their desktops. These desktops will require access to the Active Directory, app and user data, which is located somewhere on-premises. With the existing Citrix infrastructure in place, this is very simple to do. But what about a new customer that doesn't have any Citrix infrastructure? Would they have to set up all of these components in a very short time to give access to physical desktops? Would you as an admin want to put the effort to create a completely new setup to give users temporary access in a business continuity scenario? A better way for new customers would be for them to utilize one of Citrix cloud services, such as Citrix virtual desktop service. In these service offerings, all of the Citrix components are created and managed in the cloud by Citrix. The only components, apart from the virtual delivery agents, that need to be installed are a pair of Citrix cloud connectors. And you're ready to create the catalog and delivery group before giving users access to their physical desktops. Till now, we've spoken about giving access to existing users who already had physical desktops on-premises. What about those users that are new or those that didn't have their own machines in the office, such as contractors or third-party people? You can easily use the same service to provision desktops in the cloud for these users. You can use SD-WAN to quickly link the two resource locations and provide the cloud desktops access to the Active Directory and the data. This not only reduces the operational overhead of managing Citrix components, but also reduces the time it takes to get new users productive 
as they can securely as access their desktops from any device. In the final conceptual architecture, you can see that we can make it even easier to get a setup up and running. For this, we can use Citrix Managed Desktops. The only thing that the admin needs to do is to set up a base image for the desktops in the cloud using a pre-created WBD workload template. And then the rest can be managed via the console. You use machine creation services to clone the VMs in Azure and create your catalog. And then you can make them available to your users in almost no time at all. I'll hand over to Rob to talk about MCS and all of its goodness. Thank you, Mayank. Uh, let's go into machine creation services. So machine creation services is together with uh, provisioning services, the uh, image management solution for Citrix. And provisioning services is not available in cloud uh, environments, it's only available on premises, but you could manage it from cloud. And machine creation services is available in Azure on premises and any cloud environment. And machine creation services works with a master image. And that master image, you can create it as CCM, but you can also create it with uh, Citrix app layering and build an app layered uh, master image. Once you're happy with the master image, you create a snapshot. And once you deploy it as the pool, that snapshot is turned into a full clone. And uh, that full clone then, uh, uh, there's a master image copied to uh, Azure. It's not uh, per data store because there's no per data store in Azure. There's a master image there that's a read-only master image that is used to create the uh, VDAs. And you have an identity disk there, which is small, and there is a delta disk which uh, will grow over time when the user is working and will be deleted and recreated when the when the machine is restarted the delta disk will get uh, get the reads and, reads and writes and that's uh, if that doesn't perform well then the user will have a performance hit so we will get into that later on uh, mcs is available from citrix managed desktop and citrix virtual desktop so I think the best thing is that we should look at a demo right now. So let's take a look at a demo of Citrix machine creation services. So for this, I have to go to a, a, a Citrix uh, Manage Desktop console. Let's come over there right now. Click on Manage Desktops. Always hoping that the Demo gods are kind to us. So here we go. It's opening the console. It's a different console than you're used to because this is the studio console for managed desktop, which is born in the cloud and it's not uh, Citrix Studio, which you know from CVAT uh, that we have in the CVAT environment. So if you would create a catalog, first you would build uh, or import an, uh, an image and you would set up a network connection to your on-premises environment and set up a cloud subscription or use Citrix subscription and then you create a catalog. There are two ways to create a catalog. You have a quick create where you just pick a, an instance, a region, a name and you say the number of machines that you need or you can do a custom create and there you have three options, multi-session, uh, so a multi-user environment, a static environment, it's a private desktop or a random environment where everybody gets a, a desktop assigned at the time as they log on and when they log off the desktop is destroyed. Uh, we will do multi-session here. Then we have subscription. By default it's Citrix Managed but you could use your own subscription. So you could uh, bring your own subscription where, and with that you would have more access to different regions and uh, re uh, regions we don't offer. You could set up a network connection to your local network. So um, a VNet or an SD-WAN to your on-premises network to access data over there. You could uh, select a region there. We have these regions with Citrix Managed, but if you have, uh, you bring your own subscription, you could pick any region as long as the WVD workloads are there. If you have Azure um, hybrid uh, benefits, uh, then you could use this also. You could select it here. There we have disks, of course, spinning disks or premium SSD disk. And if you uh, hang on in this uh, masterclass, we will talk about MCS IO in a, in a minute. So uh, these disks might, might be interesting. We did 
Logins VSI test. So we've uh, established what kind of sessions would be available with which no which instances, and if you have a light workload, then maybe you would get 16 sessions on a really light instance. But please test. It's testing, testing, testing. It's really your workload. Your users are different than Login VSI workloads. Then you select the master image. I'm going to select the one with Office 365 Pro Plus. You give it a name. 365 demo uh, and I can create the catalog. Creating the catalog takes a little bit of time so I created one already uh, up front. So you can update the image here. So you say I have a new image, you say how long it takes before people have to log off. Uh, you could also delete the catalog if you want to. You could um, add applications there. So we can add applications from the start menu or by path. So we're gonna load the applications from the start menu. Um, and we're gonna see, we want Excel in the list also. So we're gonna add Excel there. Um, and now Excel is also added. So I can add published applications or a published desktop, uh, just like you're known from Citrix. We can add subscribers here. So if I have invited users or added users, uh, I can uh, add them here as a subscriber. So those users here, it's me only now, uh, can access the published desktop or the published applications. Uh, there's a machine running, it's on, it's registered. There's zero, zero sessions running right now and I could put the machine in maintenance mode. I could shut it down, I could restart it. I could also go to monitor just like here to see what's going on with this machine, what the load is, etc., etc. Issues that might uh, occur there. And at last, this is quite important. By default, if you create a catalog, it's set to cost saver because we want to make sure that you are not spending too much money in cloud. By default, that means that after 50 minutes of idle time, the desktop is disconnected and etc., etc. But you can customize these things. So if you say like, hey, but during the week, we start at seven in the morning and we finish at seven in the evening. I want a capacity buffer of 30% and a minimum running machines of four and the evening is lower. Then this becomes a custom set. But there are more options there. You can have eight to eight hours Monday, Friday, eight hours daily, always on. It's whatever you want uh, it to be. And with that, we're going back to the masterclass because uh, creating a catalog uh, takes a little bit of time. So let's move back to our uh, slides. So now we are going to talk about uh, on-demand provisioning, machine creation services and cloud on-demand provisioning. It's only available in Azure. It's not something that's available with Citrix Managed Desktop, but it's available with uh, Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service. Uh, right now. It's a cost saver. What's uh, what's the deal here? It's been around for a while, but I've noticed that not everybody is aware of this and it can really save you some cost. So it is a fast catalog creation service, so to say, because it does not create the virtual machines until you need those virtual machines. It, uh, it f powers on instances faster because everything is ready for it, the instance is just not there, but that's the only thing that really needs to be done. So the virtual machines will only be created once you give the power on command. You will not see those virtual machines within studio until they are created. So we will show the demo uh, real soon how that uh, how that works. And they use Azure Managed Disk, of course, which is elastic and uh, uh, also uh, helps you and saves you costs there. And if you combine this with uh, MCS uh, IO, you could save uh, quite a bit of money in, uh, in cloud. And well, beside performance, I think also saving money in cloud might be a good thing. So without further ado, let's uh, roll this demo. So I'm gonna switch to another desktop for now um, to do a really quick demo on an on-demand provisioning. So let's start some machines. As you see in the right side in the, uh, in the Azure console, there are no virtual machines. There are only a couple of disks. There right now is a network interface of snapshots. So now here the virtual machines are being created. And the second one will is also there now. Um, so then you see that uh, things are building up once we power them on. And now that if we power them off, we will see the same uh, resources disappear there. So 
they should disappear. I'm a little bit impatient mostly. Uh, uh, there they go. So the virtual machines are gone, less resources, less money. It's a cost saver. And uh, if I do a refresh here, then you will see some of the disks also disappear. There they go. And that's it. That's uh, the demo. And let's uh, move on to the next uh, slides. So let's take a look at MCS IO. Fast, faster, fastest. Because it can never be too fast when we talk about workloads. So Citrix, first Labs and Desktop workloads can be delivered both PVS and MCS. And for cloud-based workloads, MCS is the only option if your workloads run in cloud. You can have PVS managed workloads, but they have to run on premises. PVS is a network-based streaming solution, very flexible and powerful. PVS contains a built-in caching mechanism, which gives the flexibility of being able to manipulate and reduce your virtualization I.O. It's called cache to RAM with overflow to disk. And now this is also available on uh, MCS. MCS provisioning leverages the underlying hypervisor. Uh, however, the resulting I.O. profile of an MCS provisioned environment is dictated by your chosen hypervisor and shared and network storage. So storage is always slower than memory. Uh, of course, we came a long way with the SSD. It's faster, brought more speed, but memory will still will uh, will still win this battle hands down. MCSIO uh, brings the caching advantages of PVS uh, to MCS. So MCSIO reduces the I.O. load through a two-tier system. The first tier is uh, the in-memory cache and the second tier is uh, the overflow to disk. So it, di it distributes the I.O. load and yeah, make sure that you size correctly. You are using extra RAM to uh, offload I.O. load. In 1903, we, uh, not the year, the build, we uh, redesigned MCS I.O. So MCS I.O. version two now, uh, we, we, we changed from a raw disk to a formatted disk so that you can also offload uh, app, uh, app disk files and st uh, stuff like that. It's now available on Azure and on premises hypervisor, of course, you have a choice for on-demand and persistent write-back cache disk. And your persistent write-back cache disk will be, uh, you can create it only through PowerShell. We recommend uh, a spinning disk over a premium SSD, and that's because of cost, but also because of performance. And we will show you that later on. Um, and the results, it's improved st st stability, it's better performance and lower storage cost now. It could also al almost be a poster. So what's the differences? Without MCSIO, uh, the disk, the Delta disk is caching all read-write operations as we saw in the MCS uh, section. And with MCSIO, all the IO operations are handled by te temporary cache. And without MCS, the delta disk and the master disk reside on the same storage and with MCSO you can uh, be, they can be placed on different storage so you can have fast storage for your read write you need an extra driver for uh, MCSIO you have to select that when you install the VDA so make sure that you do that so if we talk about Azure and we say SSD versus spinning disk with the cache let's um, Let's look at uh, some uh, tests that Login VSI uh, did together with Citrix. Uh, we always went with the SSD option because it provided us with performance and no one would pick a spinning disk as it would kill performance. But what if performance was not the issue? Would you pick the spinning disk? What if a spinning disk in MCISO would you give you better performance than an SSD? Is it possible? It is. So the big difference next to pricing is that the response times are way better. So you see here, this is a spinning disk um, with a two, two gig uh, cache and the response time went down from 949 to 842 milliseconds, which is massive. Also, the scalability went up. So this is a, a SSD and this is a, a spinning disk with a cache and we are the 77 uh, users. Of course, this is a standard workload, uh, a login VSI worker. But if you look this in the bigger picture, you have hundreds of servers running, then those 
and two or three users multiplied by a few hundred servers suddenly could save you a few instances. So this is a really interesting part and a spinning disk is cheaper in Azure than an SSD. So this is the PowerShell script um, that you could use to, uh, to create it. I'm not going to create it. it. It serves no purpose to show you uh, how I run a PowerShell script. I'm pretty sure that all of you can run a PowerShell script as well. So but this is the PowerShell script. Um, I, th there's a blog from 2020 there where, it's, where we explain this. So please read that if you want more information. So what's the summary? Say so we have a format of this to redirect app data, event log, etc. Less instances needed in larger environments because of better scalability, cost saving. More scalable compared to SSD, uh, lower response time, which is better for user experience, and uh, cheaper uh, disks are needed. And with that, I want to move on to uh, Citrix uh, user layers. So let's talk about user layers. Uh, and before I'm going to talk about user layers, I'm going to talk about app layering because I want to make sure that everybody understands what app layering is. So many do image management like they used to do in the 90s. Uh, I'm an old guy, I used to do image management also in the 90s. Create uh, That's creating a virtual machine on a hypervisor or on a cloud environment, install some drivers, add some software, tune the damn thing to make it perform and then deploy it. And it sounds great, right? For day one when you deploy. But what about day two and all those other days? So then you have your applications running there um, and then you need to add uh, things there. So day two arrives and you're asked to install new applications in, uh, in uh, sad image. You're asked to update all software, windows, drivers. An old school approach was to open the image, change what needs to be changed and close it up. Nice and tidy, no harm done. And I call this a run for the cliff approach. Removing software, updating software, leaves tem temporary files behind. Adding, changing, removing is never done without making a bit of a mess of things. There will be something laying around, something that you wish was not there. And at some point in time, after numerous of updates, the image will suddenly fail. It will show unexpected behavior. And you got nowhere to run. You got nowhere to return to, uh, but to build everything from scratch. But where do you start at that point? Who documented exactly what was in the image, exactly what you did in the image? And to make things worse, what if you had two desktop pools with different software requirements? So one has accounting software, the other one had a PDF writer. They are for a certain type of users and the other for the other type of users. Um, you need to maintain two images at that time. What if it's five desktop pools with five images? Who's keeping track of all those changes? Uh, I think it's a run for the cliff. So, but we got your back at Citrix. And we have app layering. With Citrix app layering, we can overcome that image sprawl, that uh, management nightmare. We enable you to break down the image into layers. So one for the operating system, one for the platform you, uh, you want to deploy on, and many for software. And once you know what mix of layers you need for a desktop pool, so Windows 10, a platform layer for Azure and accounting and Chrome, um, you just select the layers, you merge them into a master image, and then you deploy that to become the desktops they work on. And updating on day two, it's pretty easy. You take your Windows 10 image, uh, you uh, layer, you update that layer, uh, and deploy that layer to all the master images in need for the update. So one to many update management, completely in control. And the best thing, merging layers, uh, a layered image, I would call it a merged uh, image, that has zero performance impact. Uh, zero performance impact. It's tested by Logger VSI and other uh, uh, independent parties. So what, a, uh, what about if the user needs a specific application that the rest of the pool does not need? Now depending on the application it could be required to not have it in the image. Uh, you could do it of course with app masking but you could also do it with uh, elastic layers and elastic layers can be used uh, per machine, per user, uh, just uh, depending on your needs. 
<clears throat> elastic layers have, of course, a performance impact. They are, uh, you add them to uh, uh, a machine later on, so they will have some impact. So please take care that you don't overdo elastic layers. If you can create a layered image instead, that's, uh, that's a better approach. <clears throat> and then we come to user layers. And user layers are writable elastic layers. So user layers are assigned one to one. You can have only one writable user layer per OS layer per domain. And they add persistency to a non-persistent desktop because non-persistent desktops are of course management wise and uh, are they uh, the best option for your uh, solution because after the user logs off, everything is deleted, they get a fresh machine. Everything which is fresh is always better than uh, things that have been used before. And with, the, with um, user layers, you have uh, a few options there. So we have session uh, layers for Office 365. You have Office 365 layers. And there is a full layer. And the full layer now since 1910 supports search index persistence between session. And the full layer also uh, captures all user data setting locally installed apps. So that's a real good uh, value add uh, as compared to average logics. And there's one thing. I want to mention is also that like we, we also support Azure, of course. So that's uh, an interesting part. Azure is just a platform layer and also Azure Gov is just a platform layer and you could store your uh, files and your uh, layers in the central uh, repository on Azure with Azure files. So that's, uh, if you want to move to the cloud, the option is there. So there's a lot of information there. There are tech docs. There's a, a video that Mayank made uh, that's uh, found on TechZone. There is a, a technical overview PDF that you could find, and a lot of docs there. That's is a lot of information. We are still building uh, out uh, some cool things coming this year that we can't talk about right now. But this is uh, uh, this is available already. So we're going to move on to the next section. Thanks, Rob for all that information regarding MCS and app layering. Let's also take a look at the other profile management solutions that are available. If for some reason app layering is not your cup of tea and locally installed apps are not needed to be saved across sessions. The profile management solution is required when we need non-persistent desktops and more than just the standard office apps from the O365 suite such as Teams and OneDrive are being used. The Teams installer saves data in the profile and if this is not persisted, it would need to be downloaded each time a user tries to log on to a fresh desktop. FSLogix with its office container and profile container is an alternative. Based on your requirement of whether or not the entire profile or just the office part of the profile needs to be retained after user log off, you can choose one of the two container types. The value add that Citrix provides is when a user has more than one simultaneous session running. FSLogix is a VHD based solution and as such the VHD is mounted on the machine running the first session the user logs into and then the VHD gets locked in for read and write. That is to say that it can allow only one session to write back the changes. Consider the example of a physician working from home. She launches the Outlook from her corporate Windows 10 device and launches the hospital's EMR system on an iPad a few minutes later to quickly check a few patient details and make some annotations. Now this could be sessions running on two different machines. The first session that the physician logged into for Outlook has the VHD mounted in read or write mode, while the AMR app would have the VHD mounted in read only. So the annotations and the patient records made in the session on the iPad will not be written to the profile when she logs off. Profile Manager helps to synchronize files that are changed in the read only sessions. The centralized profile storage user store acts as a temporary storage for the writes in the read-only sessions. This allows multiple sessions to write changed files back and those changes are merged 
with the last right of win strategy at file level. Changes to the registry hive like ntuser.dat are merged at the registry key level. This works in tandem with the FSLogix VHD merge technology. Let's take a look at the configuration of this feature. For prerequisites, we will need a FSLogix profile container and we have to ensure that the profile type is set to try for read write profile and fall back to read only. That's mode 3. Citrix policies will have to have enable profile management enabled and the path user store policy set to a valid path. The configuration can be done either by Citrix policies or via GPO. If you were to use Citrix policies, click policies in Citrix Studio. In the create policy window, type enable multi-session write back for FSLogix in the search box. Select the policy, select enable and then click OK. If you want to use the GPO, open up the GPO editor. Under computer configuration, administrative templates, Citrix components, profile management, advanced settings, double click the enable multi-session write back for FSLogix profile container policy. Select enabled and then click OK. Run a GP update force in the command line to complete the setting. Considering we have been talking about Office 365, another great value add is our optimization for Teams. Rob will walk you through this. Let's take a look at Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams is supported on both cloud and on-premises environments and requirements for delivery controllers 1906.2 or later. And there are some VDA requirements like a minimum version of 1906.02 and Windows 10 1906.1909. It's also supported on Windows Server 2012 R2 and later and you need browser content re redirection which is uh, enabled by default when you install it by the GUI but not when you install it uh, with CLA so then you have to include it. Make sure that you do. It is fully supported on Windows Workspace of the Workspace app for Windows. Uh, audio video screen sharing, 1907 for minimum version, uh, workspace app for Linux, we have an audio and early access release, it's 2004, and uh, uh, workspace app for Mac iOS, that's on the roadmap, it's coming as soon as we have uh, Linux uh, finished and going. There are some audio and video codecs, that's the S SDP offer. Uh, for audio, there is Opus G711, G722. For videos, H264 and VP9. Uh, preferred configurations are Opus and VP9 for Teams peer-to-peer uh, -peer calls and 264, 722 for Teams meetings. Communication is preferred over UDP because you want to uh, get some traffic there. And TCP over 443 is there as a fallback. We have a management uh, site policy control so you can say you want to enable teams direction or you don't want to enable teams direction if you enable teams direction a uh, uh, race registry key is set this ms teams are their support as you will also see in the, um, the demo we will set uh, and optimize and optimize that you see the differences but that's where the key is being set if it doesn't work read the uh, knowledge base articles because you have to make sure that all the other things that i mentioned before are in place there is some endpoint tuning so what, what the optimization does uh, is that it detects what your endpoint can handle so it will not uh, uh, give you a 1080 uh, p uh, uh, resolution when your endpoint is not fast enough to handle that but if you decide like hey i know what's best and i don't want anybody to uh, to control my device then you can disable you can override the performance and uh, set what you think should be the, um, the performance of the endpoint. You can also disable VP9 or disable H264 and play around with that. Make just test and make sure that you find the best uh, solution out there for your uh, environment. So, and then this is going to be really interesting technical. Let's go over the high level architecture of the environment. So, 
what's going on with the optimization. It's not an optimization pack, it's a built-in in the workspace app. So we should not talk about optimization pack, it's optimization of Teams from Citrix. So first, the user launches Teams in a virtual desktop. Teams authenticates to Office 365. Tenant policies are pushed down to the Teams client and relevant turn and signaling channel info is relayed. Teams detects that it's running in a VDA and makes an API call to Citrix JavaScript, which is embedded in Teams. ACX WebRTC JavaScript opens a secure WebSocket connection to the WebSocket service.exe running on the VDA. That's a 127.0.1 over port 902 connection. WebSocket service.exe runs as a local system account on session 0, performing TLS termination and user mapping and spawning WebSocket agent.exe, which now runs inside the user session. WebSocket agent.exe now initiates a generic virtual channel by calling into the Citrix ACX browser redirection services, that's CTX SVC host.exe. And then the, uh, the workspace app, uh, WFICA uh, 32exe so that's the ACX engine, spawns a new process called ADX Teams. Exe, which is the new web RTC engine used for Teams. ACX Teams.exe and Teams.exe now have a two-way virtual channel path and can start processing multimedia requests. Um, and when PRA, user A, uh, clicks on a call button so that Teams.exe com communicates with the Teams service in Azure and an end-to-end -end signaling path is established with PRB. Teams will ask ADX Teams for a series of supported call parameters, so codex resolution, all that kind of thing. That's known as the SDP offer, uh, which are then re relayed uh, through the signaling path to team service in Azure and from there to the other peer. And once the SDP offers, offer ends a single pass negotiation and the ICE con connectivity checks, which is NAT firewall traversal, uh, are completed, SRTP media will flow between A6 Teams at Exe and the other peer, or Office 365 conference servers if it's in a meeting. So with that we came to the Microsoft Teams optimization demo, so what are we going to show? We are going to show uh, a call being made by me, uh, located in the Netherlands, uh, to uh, Mayank who is in India. Uh, let's, uh, I have to go to another screen to do this. So let's go to my desktop and uh, let's uh, see if we can get Mayank to join me. So we have an unoptimized Teams over here. I'm going to show you that Teams is not optimized. And that's because we have uh, a setting which you can set by policy. But I did it manually. I set the MS Teams reader support to zero. And here's Mayank. He's uh, back from yoga, completely happy again, relaxed. But you see that the image is quite pixelated. It's not really the perfect image. So I'm going to put up a performance uh, monitor next to it. So here we see the graphics engine. It's taking 10, 14, 15% of uh, CPU. Teams is taking a lot of uh, percentage. So the whole CPU level of uh, the VDA is quite high. And if we look at this again, this is the graphics engine and, and everything, uh, the movement, everything, it has to be compressed with HDX and the VDA has, is taking a lot of load there. So this is quite a bad uh, performance for the video. So now we're gonna close this call and we are going to optimize Teams. You. So I'm going to first close Teams, oh, the other button. Everybody. Sometimes we are too fast with these things, so if I now launch Teams, it may not be optimized instantly and I have to restart it again. It is what it is. I'm uh, impatient mostly in those things, so I don't wait long enough. But let's see what it does. No. This one is not optimized yet, so let's do this one as again. It's a demo. Demos, uh, things go uh, crazy sometimes. 
Now we have a Citrix HDX optimized uh, team. So now again, I'm not sure if uh, Mayank is also ready, but let's uh, start the camera. So here's my camera. Again, I think already the picture is uh, a lot better. So let's see if he can join in. There he's coming. And there he is again. So <laughs> if we now look at, at, at the image, he, he's working over a really bad connection in India right now. We have a, a really uh, tight bond with, so this, this is pretty well. I think he's working over, over his phone, over a 4G connection right now. Uh, we have to check out the latency. We will do that also. Um, but here you see the process, the graphics process for Citrix running. It's it's not using anything anymore. The graphics engine is at 0, 0.0% almost. And the whole performance has gone, uh, yeah, it's for, for the better. The CPU level is down and you see the image now also, it, 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 it took a bit of time to, um, to get better, but now the image is almost perfect. So this is, this is exactly what you want to see. You can read Citrix on this shirt there. So it's, this is a perfect, uh, uh, perfect picture. And it offloads it to the, to the client. So I will uh, explain that in a minute, how that uh, works. Okay, now we go back to the slides. Wait, thanks. So I was located in the Netherlands. Uh, Mayank is located in India and Pune. And I'm 7,500 kilometers away from uh, uh, the US East data centers with a 120 millisecond latency. He's 14,000 kilometers away from US East with a 340 milli millisecond latency. And that is also showing, of course, in the first uh, image. And of course, the, um, the load is all on the VDA. Uh, which is running in US East. So the traffic is going up and down and it's it's not really a, a good uh, picture. So we are 6,900 kilometers away from each other and um, in optimized mode, uh, the yen points will, will talk to each other and that will improve uh, uh, the performance of the call. It will also improve the load on the VDAs because the load is now offloaded to the VDA, uh, from the VDA to the endpoint. And that was showing in the picture that we saw. For more information, uh, there is a proof of concept guide, Citrix team optimization, there's a text on video, there are Citrix blogs with team optimization announcements with a lot of information. There's, there are two webinars, there's one webinar is a Geek's Guide to Microsoft Teams plus SD-WAN. Matthew Brooks gave that one, uh, you can find it on Cit at Citrix. And there's a webinar on the Tenzig YouTube page that we did with Tenzig about uh, Citrix and Teams and we run on their Citrix ready clients. Uh, it has an in-depth traffic analysis that we did with Wireshark and so on. So please check out those webinars and the documentation. And with that, I would like to hand over to Mayank. He's going to talk about uh, browser content redirection. Mayank, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rob. And it was great seeing you face to face after a while. Similar to the optimization of teams where media encoding and decoding is done by the client to alleviate server load. We have a feature called browser content redirection, which helps alleviate the load of rendering media heavy websites from the servers. Let's take a look at how this feature makes windows virtual desktops based workloads more performant and increases single server scalability. Browsers consume large amounts of server resources, even when idle, as shown by the graph from a real user over the course of five minutes. RAM and CPU resources are drastically impacted by leisurely browsing web pages. In a virtual desktop, users will use a browser to access web-based work applications and personal applications like social media and news sites. The embedded video and advertisements have a significant impact 
on expensive cloud-based server resources. HTML5 content redirection breaks the browser up into the user interface and the viewport, the portion of the browser that's displaying the web content. The user interface portions of the browser are running on the virtual desktop. The viewport portion of the browser is being rendered on the endpoint and blended back into the virtual desktop's UI. Configuring browser content redirection is done via Citrix virtual apps and desktop policies. Two different policies must be applied. Browser content redirection must be allowed and access control lists must be defined to specify the whitelist of URLs whose content needs to be redirected. Although this star wildcard character is permitted, it is not permitted in the protocol and domain portion of the URL. Protocol could be HTTP or HTTPS and the domain is the URL. So you would type in HTTP colon backslash backslash and the URL like www.youtube.com. There are three scenarios for how content is fetched and rendered. Server fetch and server render. Here the virtual desktop's browser fetches the content from the website and renders it from within the local browser. Server fetch and client render. The virtual desktop's browser fetches the content from the website. The content is sent to the endpoint and then rendered locally. The content within the viewport is blended with the browser's UI. Client fetch and client render. The URL is sent to the endpoint so that it can fetch the content directly. The content within the viewport is then blended with the browser's UI. When the server fetches and renders, we consume significant resources on the virtual desktop. This is also the fallback option when the endpoint is unable to directly contact the resources when the endpoint does not have a browser, let's say a thin client. By moving the rendering to the endpoint, we can lower the virtual desktop CPU and RAM requirements. But in order to accomplish this, the endpoint must have a browser to do the rendering. By moving the rendering and fetching to the endpoint, we lower the virtual desktop CPU and RAM and network requirements. In addition to requiring a browser on the endpoint, we'll also need a browser to have internet access. For cloud-based resources, we would suggest using the client fetch and client render unless there's a requirement for using proxies that are to be configured at the server side. And in those situations, we would suggest using server fetch client render. The slide shows the requirements for getting browser content redirection working. I'm not going to run through each of these, but for the Internet Explorer, the browser extension that is required is installed by the VDA itself. What you need to do for IE is to configure the following options. Clear the Enhanced Protected Mode under Internet Options, Advanced and Security. And we have to check Enable third-party browser extensions under Internet Options, Advanced and Browsing. This is on the VDA. Similarly, for the Chrome browser, you will need to install the Content Redirection extension from the Chrome Web Store. The Chrome extension can also be deployed using GPO and ADMX policies to avoid having to recreate the base image or the Chrome app layer. Enabling browser content redirection not only offloads the media rendering from the CPU and reduces memory requirements for the browser on each cloud hosted machine, leading to higher single server scalability, but also helps reduce data ingress and egress costs as the large files do not need to be sent up to your cloud. Let's do a quick demo of browser content redirection. We are in a session with BCR not being enabled and I'm trying to watch a YouTube video on my phone 4G within my virtual desktop. Let's see the performance. We can see that there is severe load on the server CPU while trying to run the HD video and it often causes the video to halt. Again, remember the session is running at around 340 milliseconds latency from my location. Pretty good, all things considered. 
Now let's quickly enable BCR by switching over to the DDC and creating a new policy for browser content redirection. Under policies, click create policy and then search for browser. Select browser content redirection and allowed should be selected by default. Click OK. Select browser content redirection ACL configuration. And for example, we leave YouTube in the whitelist. Click OK. Click Next. And then select the delivery group to assign the policy to the delivery group that we want. Click Assign. In our case, it's Win 10 dedicated. Click OK. Click Next. Rename the policy to your liking. I'll keep it simple and say BCR policy. Then click Finish. Once the policy is created, we must enable the policy by clicking Enable Policy. Now let's launch that session once again. Now you can see that the video is playing much more smoothly and that we can even increase the video playback window size and it makes no difference to the CPU and the memory consumption of the server. The video plays great and we achieve greater server scalability. To quickly verify if the session is indeed having the browser content redirected, you can right click the viewport and check for this drop down. It's a win-win situation for all concerned. Another major component of a cloud-based desktop model is the connectivity back to the on-premises data center. For most customers, moving all of the data into the cloud is not an option. And so information must travel between the cloud hosting, the VDI resources, and the data center. This also could be a component that helps optimize the data being sent on the channel to reduce the cost and ensure a great user experience. At Citrix, we suggest using ST1. Let's see its benefits when connecting to Azure hosted resources of Citrix managed desktops. Citrix SD-WAN optimizes all the network connections needed by Citrix managed desktops. Working in concert with the HTX technologies, Citrix SD-WAN provides quality of service and connection reliability for ICA and out-of-band Citrix managed desktops traffic. Citrix SD-WAN supports the following network connections multi-stream ICA connection between users and their virtual desktops, internet access from the virtual desktop to websites, SaaS apps and other cloud properties, access from the virtual desktop back to on-premises resources such as Active Directory, file servers and database servers, real-time interactive traffic carried over RTP from the media engine in the workspace app to cloud-hosted unified communications services such as Microsoft Teams. And like BCR, client-side fetching of videos from sites like YouTube and Vimeo. Additionally, Citrix SD-WAN provides optimized connectivity for Citrix managed desktops including deep HDX visibility to prioritize delivery based on class of service, VoIP packet duplication for reliability, security over the internet, it has a simple and integrated admin workflow and it's low latency with congestion avoidance. Let's take a deeper look into the architecture. Citrix Managed Desktop Service provisions Azure hosted Windows Virtual Desktop workloads on demand and these are made available to endpoints. It can also provision SD-WAN instances in the Azure tenant using the orchestrator service, establishing connectivity to the SD-WAN overlay network in other data centers, clouds or branches. Then with network location service, we can steer branch users to direct access over the corporate network to the Azure hosted Windows Virtual Desktop workloads or steer remote workers to connect via gateway service. Let's see how Citrix managed desktops using 
the Citrix managed Azure tenant with Citrix SD-WAN and the network location service work together. From the admin perspective, the admin connects to Citrix managed desktop service. The admin enters Citrix managed desktop's environment details for SD-WAN and CMD service relays them to the orchestrator service. The admin submits the configured details and the orchestrator provisions an SD-WAN instance in the Azure tenant where the CMD VDAs will be hosted. SD-WAN contacts other SD-WAN instances in branch offices and automatically builds an overlay network of virtual paths and announces the route to each Azure tenant where the CMD VDAs will be hosted. The admin enters and submits the Citrix Managed Desktop's details. The CMD service provisions an HA pair of cloud connectors for management communication and then provisions the Windows desktop VDAs in the Azure tenant. The admin enters and submits a PowerShell script to configure network location service which identifies whether a workspace user's device is located in a branch on the internet based on the source public IP. Now let's see how Citrix managed desktops with the Citrix SD-WAN and network location service work together from the user's perspective. User launches Workspace app. It connects to the Workspace service, which contacts the identity microservice to authenticate using available identity services. If Active Directory is being used, it would contact the domain controller via a cloud connector across the SD-WAN network. After authentication is complete, the Workspace app populates with approved resources. Next, the user selects Citrix Managed Desktops within the Workspace app and this contacts the Workspace service. Workspace service then contacts Managed Desktop service to obtain the connection details. Finally, Managed Desktop Service contacts the Network Location Service to verify whether the endpoint is on the customer internet or remote. It then sends a message to the VDA via the cloud connector to prepare for an incoming session and returns the ICA file to the Workspace app, including information to contact the designated VDA. The Workspace app sends a connection request to the Citrix Managed Desktop VDA via the private internet IP address which is routed via the SD-WAN network and the HDX session to the managed desktop is established. Also now the managed desktop can communicate with other resources in the internet like SIFS shares or the Active Directory. You can read more about Citrix managed desktops and SD-WAN connections from this link. Now I'll hand it back to Rob to talk about our monitoring and analytics value add. Thanks, Mirang. Learn a lot about SD-WAN again. It's not my, uh, my core topic. Let's go into Citrix Analytics. Citrix Analytics is divided in three areas, Security Analytics, Performance Analytics, and Operations Analytics. Security Analytics prevent internal threats and data exfiltration attacks through user behavior. Security Analytics protect applications from external attacks and track sensitive files uh, via DLP engines. Performance analytics monitors end user and app performance and highlights issues. Operation analytics tracks app and user information, uh, usage information. With security analytics, a user will connect like they usually do to their Citrix workspace where they have access to all their resources. Those services will, com will communicate uh, with Citrix Analytics service. All of this is hosted within Citrix Cloud. We can also tie back customer managed CVET resources location to, to communicate with CAS. So site aggregation has to be configured and the smart uh, tools agent need to be installed on the uh, delivery controller as shown in the architecture. All of these are known as data sources. These specific data sources are all Citrix data sources. Data sources transmit logs directly to Citrix Analytics, which stores them in a 
customer database. This data is retained for 13 months. Even if the data sources are turned off, data that already was captured will remain in the database for 13 months. Citrix Analytics analyzes the data through machine learning microservices and can perform actions when unusual or suspicious, suspicious activities occur. And these actions can also be performed on demand by an admin through an analytics console. These are the supported data sources for security analytics as well as any agents that are required for security analytics to be able to collect data and perform actions. I'm not going to read them out, you can read them uh, later on. So let's talk about secure um, user experience score. Let's first take a look at the user experience itself. We see two phases with uh, when we talk about user experience. The first phase is the logon phase. The second phase is the interactive session phase. The phase the user working in is working in, in a session. It's the interactive uh, session phase. So if we uh, first focus on the logon process, we can break it down in a number of steps. It starts with authentication, uh, goes down to brokering and all the way down to user profile loading. If these steps, if one of these steps are slow, then the user experience will be bad. Uh, once the logon process is finished, we will enter the interactive um, session phase. Different metrics uh, determine the user experience. Metrics like ICA round trip time, latency of the WAN connection, application launch times, and so on. And there's more, of course, because applications won't run without a backend. The whole application chain uh, determines whether a user has a good experience or not. So if we combine both, we notice that there are a number of factors involved when it comes to user experience. And all of these and more are determined, are used to, do, to determine the user experience score. So how does this work? User experience score is calculated uh, with gathering the metrics like we uh, mentioned before and uh, push them through a calculation. And based on several factors, relative factors, but, uh, and modeling with also benchmarking, the experience will get a value. And the value ranges from 1 to 100, depending on the metrics it received. 1 being a poor user experience and 100 being a perfect one. So if I was an admin, then anything below 40 and maybe anything below 60 would be something that I would really focus on if you want to uh, make sure user experience is good. So let's take a look at user risk score. User behavior analytics allows customers to categorize user behavior and detect anonymous uh, behavior through our machine learning algorithm. It's a closed loop autonomous system that allows for notifications and automatic policy control within the system. This works very similar to how a credit card company works and analyzes user behavior. Uh, I'll show you something in a demo real soon. So, based on what you do, based on what a user is accessing, what, what a user is receiving, the score will change. Information from different data sources um, are sent to Citrix Analytics services. Those are assessed uh, based on policy-based violations uh, and anomalies. User behavior modeling over time or peer group, no peer group normalization and then the user scores created based on an aggregate level of risk a user processes to the organization. And again, we have a zero to a hundred, but this time it's still the way around. A hundred is a high risk and a zero is a low risk. I will show in the demo. And last thing before we go to a demo, uh, there is more information to be found on uh, TechZone, of course, and we have a Tech Insights video available and a Citrix blog that talks more about the deeper view and the user experience. Check these out. TechZone is filled with interesting articles, getting more and more each time, and uh, I think there's really good content there. So, with that, let's uh, dive into the demo of Citrix Analytics. So, to do the demo, I'm going to switch over to the Citrix uh, Cloud Console. Let me uh, add that right now. So, I opened uh, Analytics already. Uh, we have security performance and operations, as I said in the in the presentation. So this is the security center, and if we look, for instance, at Georgina, Georgina has a high score, 99 score. So if I click on Georgina, I can see what's going on. See 
as a medium flag that she was logged on from a new location for the first time. Uh, she has a potential data exfiltration, so if I look what's going on, a lot of uh, data has been uh, exfiltrated. She has also extensive access to uh, sensitive files and so on. And there was a, a, a endpoint analysis scan failed, but that's not that's a low risk if that happens once. But she also is downloading quite a lot of files and she has a jailbroken device. So I can imagine she's at 99. That's that's pretty normal. Um, we can look at, let's say, compromised endpoints. So what what endpoints are unmanaged, what endpoints had a failure for endpoint protection scan, what endpoints are jailbroken. So you get quite a, a, a extensive overview there. Uh, you could have do, of course, uh, create some reports and uh, things like that. This is really extensive view. There's also a tour here. So go to analytics, uh, there's demo, dot cloud.com uh, if you have access to Citrix Cloud and uh, do the demo is just there is a little, little button there that says uh, demo access then we go to uh, performance because I cannot show everything it's it's way too much to show everything so performance we start with the user experience because well at Citrix we really care about the user experience that's that's we we, we care more about that than anything else so you have all sites that you look at, but you can zoom into a specific site and then say like, hey, I have uh, a few users here that have a poor user experience. So if I click on that and I zoom in, then I see the session availability for those users is quite bad. That means that if you zoom in again, that two users had a machine failure, that's uh, never a good thing. So you can really dive into uh, the user experience and uh, see what's going on. You can see the number of user sessions and again I can zoom in to a specific site. Uh, session failures, I can see what was happening, what's going on there. Session responsiveness is, uh, is an interesting part. So let's click here and again here you see a query and you can build this query yourself. You can uh, click here or you can say I'm gonna I'm going to build it myself if you would like to. So if you, if we open this one, then we see that uh, session response of this was 4 to 5 milliseconds, which is way, way too high. Uh, and the inter interactive session, uh, it took uh, 43 minutes to build that. But there is a WAN latency and a data center latency that's also not really helping, uh, helping her out. Let's see what we had there. So and if we go down, we see the session logon duration. That's always an important part. So how many of the sessions are poor and how many are, are good. And again, if we zoom in, you see the same query here. So uh, there's a lot of things that you can build there. Let's wait for a minute that it, uh, it loads. It has to load quite a lot of data. And there we see the data. So now if we go into Francine, because Francine has a 30, and as I explained in this with the slides, uh, anything below 40 is pretty bad. So this is the uh, the breakdown of logon duration for uh, Francine. So broken was fast, PM start was fast, AD explanation could have been a bit faster, authentication is fast, and so on. The interactive session took 48 seconds, that's way too long. So the session responsiveness is, is bad in that time. And again, data center latency, 190 milliseconds latency in a data center. Something is wrong there. So the last section I quickly want to highlight is the operation section where you can see the download, upload total volume per user. Um, and that might be interesting to see, like if people want to go to Facebook, that uh, you can see that we're redirected to CBS News is blocked for some reason. The Pirate Bay, of course, is blocked. So this kind of information is interesting. So with that, I want to close down the volume and I'm, uh, I'm turning over to Mayank. Thanks, Rob. With that, we come to an end to the content we wanted to present. We've gone over a lot of concepts, including business continuity and how it can be achieved via remote PC access for existing users. And then we looked at extending those environments to include cloud-based resources. We showcased our value add to Windows Virtual Desktop workloads with features like 
NCS and NCSIO optimization, app layering and user layers, FSLogix profile container extension for multiple sessions, Teams optimization, and browser content redirection, followed by SD-WAN and our analytics offerings. One additional feature I want to touch upon is Workspace Environment Manager that helps reduce logon times and server load by managing CPU and memory consumption. It also manages the profile delivery. As you can see, Citrix has a lot to offer in business continuity scenarios. With that, let's open it up for questions. Hello. Yes, we made it. We made it. We have a lot of, lot of questions, Mayank. Yes, we do. <laughs> can take it away, Rob. So, yeah, so uh, we had a question. Somebody has an issue with 902 PVS Abyss Logix uh, facing black screen issue, SQL host cache. I would suggest opening a ticket because there are, I see a lot of things there. That's not something that we can quickly uh, address over here. So please, please open a ticket. Uh, I wrote down your email address. I might even reach out afterwards if you uh, want to talk about this. And we had a question if MCS works the same way in Azure as in AWS. It kind of does. Uh, the setup and everything and the way AWS uh, creates things is, of course, a little bit different. If you look at CTX241160, so that's 241160. That's an article that goes in on how you deploy an AWS and what you need to set up, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be uh, my advice there. Um, um, coming to the question regarding master images, and uh, if, if this is an image that you can build yourself, yes, uh, any master image can be recreated by the customer and then assigned as a master image to be created to be the base image for all things that are going to be uh, used in the future. And there's another question. This is regarding how about mi uh, monthly Microsoft patching uh, being performed. Uh, now, if it is for Citrix managed desktops, then, then Citrix will manage the patching of out of band ourselves. And then we will be uh, getting the image ready so that it can be it can be used as the base image by swapping out uh, the image for the non-persistent VMs. If you are doing, if the ma image is being managed by the customer itself, then they can do their own patching and then uh, refresh the catalogs as as and when they need it. Yeah. And we are Rob? where are those applications coming from? My image you select, so it's about my app layering part, I think. So the applications in the layers you install manually, I, I hope, automated. I would do everything automated. Uh, that's where they are coming from. And if you do it the old-fashioned way, you so build out an image with all the applications in there, again, I would do it out, um, automatically, of course, and never touch anything by hand if I, even a script, a publisher script is automated because you can, re can, you can repeat it and so on. Um, there's also a question about if the, if the machines are gone, this is about on-demand provisioning. So if the machines are gone, you will still be charged for the disks. Um, that's correct. If the disk, anything that's there in Azure, you will be charged for that. And that's why on-demand provisioning is, I think, a great solution because it takes away a lot of resources there. So you will be charged less, but yeah, there will be something left there. 
um, and you will be charged for that. Then we have, do you support AWS? Um, uh, we had that also before. Then, of course, that's the same with MCS. So if you look at uh, GTX241160, that, uh, that's uh, how you set up uh, MCS on AWS. So yes, we support AWS. And let me see. Um, to run teams on a non persistent VDI, I had to exclude teams for CTX hook through a registry, which exclusion teams takes up five minutes to start and runs and stable. We've seen this with server OS more. Um, again, there's an article there that's uh, 253754. Uh, that goes into troubleshooting and all the way at the bottom there is uh, uh, something about the hooks that you might have to uh, uh, exclude. Um, but it, it's it's something that we run into not that often, but we've run into it. So if you can't solve this, please open a ticket or uh, reach out to one of us um, and we might we will connect you to the right person. Okay. Uh, we questions? have a question regarding. Yeah, there is a question regarding uh, a setup that is uh, in three different locations and it's running separate sites with PVS and uh, 715 LDSR, GSLB, and all of that. And they're looking to provide BDIs to employees on a uh, temporary basis. Now, considering that they're using PVS as their base image and they're looking to do multiple sites. What I would suggest is using the uh, using uh, Citrix virtual apps and desktop service, and uh, maybe rolling out those VMs as a as a base image into uh, using Windows Virtual Desktop uh, in the and using the, the virtual apps and desktop service itself uh, to do it. So they're able to they'll be able to manage the entire uh, setup across their existing uh, systems as well as using the temporary uh, solution. Uh, bringing it up in CMD is also another option which will be a completely uh, desktop as a service solution, but that will require them to connect their existing infrastructure up to uh, Azure using Citrix managed desktops. Um, based on their requirement, they can uh, choose uh, choose to figure which one, uh, which one would be best suited for them. Um, we have a question regarding whether whether there'll be support for more than one video stream in a meeting. Uh, Multi-party meetings are not optimized that well, and it flicks between the active speaker each time. So currently, this is a limitation on the, from the Microsoft side, and we're building, we're working with them to resolve it. Uh, it's uh, it's on the roadmap. Uh, we're trying to fix this as soon as possible. Um, 13, uh, we have a question regarding uh, HTX Media Engine being installed on our local machine like it was on uh, Skype. Uh, for the Teams installation, uh, we have already in integrated that piece into the installer itself, and it automatically installs uh, on the uh, client device, uh, and it is silently installed, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the question regarding, uh, we have a question regarding the ability to monitor the performance of the system without using perform perform in the virtual machine. Yes, there is an option to manage and monitor all machines that are there in using what we call our solution as director, or if you're using Citrix Cloud, there is a monitor tab in there. You can search for the particular uh, machine, and you should be able to uh, get the uh, details of that machine. Uh, it will require you to have installed the Citrix UPM uh, file management solution there if you want to get log on duration and all of those information. Uh, specific to uh, memory, CPU, and all of that, each uh, all that data is available in, inside of the monitoring tab or the or director if you're if it's an installed solution. Rob, do you want to take a next few of them? I'm thinking that the, the other one about the integration of their solutions from Citrix with our own prem Citrix sites. Uh, that's the one that you also answered about the uh, sites in India, Europe, and of course you can integrate your on-premises with Citrix Cloud. Uh, you can manage your on-premises uh, sites from Citrix Cloud, so that's uh, possible. Um, and as again, yes, there are some 
sort of uh, taxon articles where you could look at where we have architectural diagrams. So the question about that, how you can extend your on-premises Citrix site to cloud. So there are extensive taxon articles there that I would suggest uh, to read. Um, when we use browser redirection, we we'll navigate to the internet. That's that's the client, so the client needs permission to access the, those sites. That's uh, uh, correct. I think there's also an option to to push it through the um, the VDA, the, the traffic. But uh, at, I would always do that by the client. What? Um, um, Marjan, can you tell something about the edge browser support on the client for content? So the, the question that the cost, the question, uh, if it is about the support on the client, uh, the client is always supported. We do support uh, different browsers on the client. When I speak about requirements, it's basically to do with the, the browser on the uh, virtual desktop yeah, that is running itself. So we are currently supporting IE and uh, Chrome on the virtual desktop. But I believe that Edge, uh, Chrome, as well as Firefox would be support, would work on if, you are in, if that is installed on the mm -hmm. client. Uh, we can go back and check the, check the documentation for the exact list. Um, so then I we have a question regarding yeah, we have a question regarding who navigates to the internet. Uh, is it the client? And yes, so the client will need to access, get, have access to uh, the internet pages if you want to be able to redirect it. Otherwise, we will not be able to do it. In that case, if you if the client does not have access to a particular set of pages, then it falls back to doing uh, fetching the uh, fetching the data on the server itself and then rendering it on the client. Um, again, there is a question regarding Edge and Edge browse, Edge Chromium browser. So if it is on the client, then we support it. If it is yeah, currently on the VDA, only the I, only IE and uh, uh, Fire uh, and Chrome are supported. So I see a question um, about analytics for Citrix on-premises. You can use analytics uh, for Citrix on-premises. There is a blog was on 12th of March by Priyanka. Thomas Ecker, um, and he wrote a blog of how you could have, how you can, can enable site visibility with Citrix Analytics for on-premises sites. So I would suggest that you uh, read that blog. Um, so a lot of people. I think we've answered the next question. Will the demos be required? Will the demo be sent? Uh, I think it will be available for download. Uh, yeah. We have a question regarding yeah. read write of the disks, if they're possible in Azure. Uh, does the differences read write disk uh, is possible in Azure? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if it is a particular, uh, if you're using FS Logic solution with profile container, then and Citrix profile management, then you'll be able to do multiple session read and write uh, from this. Um, uh, Rob, can you uh, take the next question regarding licensing? Licensing. What licensing is required? Citrix Cloud, MSOS, Azure subscription costs for resource. Sean, I am going to reach out to you because I do not exactly understand what you want to know. So I'm going to copy your question and I will uh, be in touch because uh, I want to make sure that I answer it uh, correctly. Right. So we have a question from. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. We are we are, we are we are almost on time at time, so I'll just quickly look at you know, the rest of the questions. We have a question regarding user layers versus uh, FS logics and container. That again, it depends on what you want to do with the particular solution. If you need uh, installed applications, then user layers would be an, would be a requirement for you. If you're looking at doing uh, particular uh, only office or only uh, the profile, then FS Logics would be a good would be a good option. Uh, if you want to do the entire profile itself as well as all installed applications, then user layers would would be an option. Exactly. Um, and if there is 
Okay, we have the same question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we need downtime for clients when Citrix Cloud team upgrades or patches virtual apps and desktop machines. So yes, uh, the machine patching would not require downtime. We can uh, basically have the machine uh, image be pre-created and updated in the background. What it will require for require is to be when it when you need downtime is to shut down the machine and that and then reboot the machine to be able to switch over to the next image. So the downtime is to just do a, a session. Uh, I mean, this users have to log off the session. You have to shut them down and then uh, repoint it to a different image and then boot them up again. Um, this is one more question regarding integrating on-prem AD with uh, public cloud. Uh, best solution for profile management and hybrid cloud model. Uh, Again, uh, profile management is a great solution if you don't want to in, uh, if you don't have integration into uh, on-prem AD. Okay. Uh, you want to take the last one, Rob? I think you answered it already. When using MCS and PVS, how is Microsoft's monthly patching performed? Well, if you have an image, uh, if you have a thing deployed with PVS, uh, for instance, then you have a master image, and I would deploy, I would patch that master image, and then deploy your targets again. If you have persistent desktops running, then of course those persistent desktops uh, need to be patched. Uh, that's a different uh, model. So. Okay, with that, we come to the end of all the questions. Uh, I hope you guys have a great session. Please share your feedback. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you.